In this video, we're going to talk about electric charge. Electric charge is a property of matter, just like mass is a property of matter. But unlike mass, which is always positive, electric charge can be positive or negative. Like mass attracts other masses, charges will also interact with other charges, except opposite charges will attract each other, while like charges will repel each other. All matter, so all objects, are made of particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons are positively charged, and ele electrons are negatively charged, while neutrons are electrically neutral, so they have no charge. In the same way that an object's mass essentially comes from the combined mass of all the protons, electrons, and neutrons that make up the object, an object's net charge comes from the net charge of all protons and electrons in the object. If the object has the same number of protons and electrons, the charge will perfectly cancel out, leaving the object neutral with no charge. Excess protons leave the object positively charged, and excess electrons leave the object negatively charged. Now we'll look at the notation for charge mathematically. Charge is given the letter Q. A capital Q is often used to indicate total charge, but both lowercase and capital Qs indicate some amount of electric charge on an object. The units of charge are coulombs, named after Charles Coulomb, and it's abbreviated with a capital C. The charge of an electron is special because it is the smallest amount of charge possible, so it is called the fundamental charge or electronic charge and is often represented with a lowercase e or e minus. Personally, I prefer to write Q sub e for the charge of an electron, and I'll use this going forward just to not get confused with the constant e that you see in math sometimes, though they are not often seen together. The charge of an electron is minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, so a very small amount of charge. The charge of a proton is equal to the charge of an electron, but it is positive. So it may be represented sometimes as E plus, though again, I will tend to write Q sub P, P indicating proton. The fundamental charge is attributed to the electron rather than the proton because protons are not fundamental particles. They are made of smaller particles called quarks, but we won't discuss that in this class. The magnitude of the electric force between two point charges is described mathematically by Coulomb's law. The electric force is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught, times the magnitude of Q1 times the magnitude of Q2 all over R squared. And here Q1 and Q2 are just your two point charges, and R is the distance between the two charges, so the straight line shortest distance between the two charges. The 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught out front is just a number. The epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space, or the vacuum, and it's a constant equal to 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12. Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Because 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is just a number, we often uh, want to simplify and not write the entire thing every single time, so we just set it equal to a constant k. And when we plug all this into our calculator, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, we get 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per, per Coulomb squared. This saves some space and makes calculations slightly quicker since we've already done a bit of it. Just know that these two are, are equivalent ways of writing Coulomb's law, they are not different. But notice this equation tells us nothing about the direction of the force, it only gives us the magnitude or the strength of the electric force. The direction of the electric force between two point charges is something we put in by hand, which often makes it a good idea to draw a picture. If we have two like charges, Q1 and Q2, sitting in space, we can draw a straight line connecting the two. And because we know the force between like charges is repulsive, each charge will push the other away along this line. My notation for the force, if two is two on one and one on two to indicate which charge is filling the force and which is exerting the force. We can do the same thing if we have opposite charges, but we draw the forces toward the other charge since the force is attractive. The two forces for each pair of charges are action-reaction pairs, so they are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, which matches our drawing. Also, if we look at Coulomb's law, notice it doesn't matter which order the charges are in. Their product will be the same, so the magnitude of the force on each charge is the same. We'll express this fact by writing it a few ways to make sure you're comfortable with the vector notation and what it is really saying. We can use absolute value bars or drop the vector hats either way 
and write the forces equal to each other. Both say the same thing. The force magnitudes or strengths of the electric force are the same. That's it. If we leave the vector hats without using absolute value bars, we are explicitly including the direction nature of the vector. Therefore, we must include a minus sign in front of one of the forces to indicate that the forces are in opposite directions. Remember that when we have a minus sign in front of a vector quantity, it is only telling us something about the direction of that vector, nothing else. If we drop the minus sign here, it would be incorrect because for a vector to be equal to another vector, the magnitude and the direction must be the same. Now let's talk about multiple charges. Say we take a simple case where we have three charges, each at a different location along a horizontal line, and we call this the x-axis. We'll call Q1 positive, Q2 negative, and Q3 positive, and we want to find the force, both magnitude and direction, on charge Q3. Well, forces, like other vector quantities, follow the superposition principle, which means to get the overall force on Q3, or the net force, we can just add each individual force that we can find using Coulomb's law. So the net force on Q3 will be the force from charge one on charge three, plus the force from charge two on charge three. Before we worry with any equations, it's really important that we look at the directions of each force and draw a free body diagram for Q3. So this is something we wanna do for first and you'll see why. If we look at Q1 and pretend Q2 doesn't exist, Q1 and Q3 are like charges, so Q1 will repel Q3 away along the positive x direction. Pretending Q1 now doesn't exist, Q3 and Q, uh, or sorry, Q2 and Q3 are opposite charges, so Q2 will pull Q3 toward it in the negative x direction. And now we can fill in equations. Coulomb's law gives us the magnitude of each force, and we can look at our free body diagram for the direction. So F1 on 3 will be positive, and our two charges will be Q1 and Q3. I'll write R sub 1, 3 to indicate the distance between Q1 and Q3, which is really important not to mix up with any other distances. R should always represent the distance between the two charges that are in the numerator. Then F2 on 3 will be negative, since it's in the minus x direction, and our two charges will be Q1 and Q3. Now, if we were given the values of each charge and the distances, we could calculate this force. It's important to notice that if we don't put in the sign correctly, which again accounts for the direction since it's a vector, the value we uh, calculate for the force will be off. And we cannot just simply put in the sign after the fact and get the correct answer because adding and subtracting will give different numbers. If you try to add these two numbers together and then just make it negative, that will be incorrect. You will not get the right answer. Now we'll briefly look at multiple charges in two dimensions. The only thing we need to be careful of in this case is to account for the vector nature of the forces and break each force into its components in the x and y directions. So to find the force on Q3 again, we'll add the individual forces, but one component at a time. Now we still need to take care of the direction first, so we'll draw a free body diagram. Charges Q1 and Q3 are alike, so Q1 will repel Q3, Charges Q2 and Q3 are opposite, so Q2, again, will pull Q3 down, uh, down into the left along a straight line joining them. You should already guess that the net force should have a downward component in the negative y direction, since both forces are pulling or pushing downward. And then if Q and, uh, Q1 and Q2 have the same magnitude of charge, their x components will cancel out, and if not, the larger charge will pull it either to the left or right. Now, filling in our equations, we can get the overall magnitude of the force for each charge just as we did before using the distance between the charges, which will be along the dashed diagonal lines I've drawn. So we'll need to find that, possibly using Pythagorean theorem, if we need to. Then to get the x component, we can use cosine of the angle I've drawn since the x component is the adjacent side of this right triangle formed by the two charges. F1 on 3x will be positive since it is to the right, and we can do the same for F2 on 3, but its x component will be negative since it's to the left. Again, we cannot forget to put in the negative sign, otherwise we will get the wrong answer. 
For the y components, we would do the same thing, but using sine functions, since the y components are along the opposite sides in the right triangles. And f1 on 3y and f2 on 3y should both be negative in this case, since they are both downward in the minus y direction. Once we have all of the components, like always, we add the x components together, we add all the y components together, and then we can get the overall magnitude of the force on charge three using the Pythagorean theorem. And finally, we can get the direction of F3 by using inverse tangent of F3x and F3y if we want to. Finding x and y components using sine and cosine and getting magnitude and direction of vectors using components should be familiar to you. If, if not, you should definitely review these and practice because we will deal with more vector quantities throughout physics too. We'll work uh, some full practice problems where we find the electric force in the future um, for you to follow, follow along with as well. So in the next video, we'll cover electric fields, which again, um, will look very similar to what we've done here. So I will see you there.